All my life, the stage was my special place. It's a place where magic would happen, where I felt completely untouchable. It all changed in what felt like one moment when the stage triggered nothing but sheer terror. At that point there, as far as I was concerned, I'd never be able to play again. I couldn't even walk out of the house. So to think of ever being able to perform was just... no. I remember one of my mentors saying to me, throw the guitar away, it's done, mate. It's done. And uh, that, that really stuck. When Nathan was at his peak, everybody knew who Nathan Cavallari was. Very cool, Mr. Cavallari, very cool. As far as being a blues guitar player goes, he's just got a lot of feel. Who knows, you know, it could be new, the next Eric Clapton or whatever, you know. It's incredible. He's been through the ringer early in life. He went through life and death. He's been through fame. He's been through less fame. You've got an endorsement deal? Yeah. You're 12 years old? <laughs> He really became kind of our poster child. He grew up before our very eyes, and here he is standing before us now, sharing his inner thoughts and some really um, raw moments about himself. Having that type of attention as a kid has both inspired me and haunted me. Before you check out, before you give in, just know you're checking out of a place you never when I'm not writing music for myself, my day job, I'm a composer. I write music for advertising. I've been doing this for over 10 years and it feels good to be working in an occupation that uses my, my skills. He is a, the true multi-instrumentalist and can put it all together. That's just a beautiful thing for me to see. He's gone from like the boy wonder guitar player to total all-encompassing musician. When I was really young when I was connected to the guitar. When I was three, they gave me a ukulele and I used to just sit there next to my dad and strum away. So my father is a bricklayer and his passions were martial arts and music. He was behind me all the time with his little yeah, ukulele, he started off playing, with ukulele. whatever I was doing, he was trying to duplicate yeah. it. He was around five, he got his own guitar then. And I just used to lock myself in my room for hours on end and just mimic, copy my favourite artists, copy my, my dad, play, 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 play and I was just so fascinated by what the guitar could do and the noises it made. When he started getting my ideas and twisting them around and that's when I went upstairs and I said to my wife Jo, I thought, this, this kid is really scary. I thought, I mean, he's, he's gonna be a full-time musician, you wait and see. Nathan was nearly six when we first noticed that something was going wrong with his health. He started having back pain one night and the doctor said to me, we're just going to do these tests. And I said to him, are you testing for leukaemia? And he said to me, why would I test for that? And I, and I said, oh, I don't know. 
and they came back and the doctor was just as flawed. He just said, you're not going to believe this. So I was the one that uh, had to explain to them that their child had leukaemia or cancer and, um, and plot out for them a pathway. The air just went out. I felt as if I'd just been thrown up against the wall. Well, it's making sick. And it's one of, probably one of the worst diseases you can get. Nathan's doctor explaining to us that we, we had a 50-50 chance that, um, that Nathan could either get through this and live or that he could, in fact, die. We didn't tell Nathan all that much. I just thought it was just too, too immense. He had to get a lumbar puncture done. I still remember his face looking up. And he says, is there going to be any pain? I mean, what, what do you say? What do you say to the child? I mean, no, there's no pain. That, that's a lie. And then I felt this excruciating pain um, in the back of my spine. I remember it just taking over my whole body and I let go. I started crying and I got through it. And I remember thinking, I'm glad that's done. And then they told me that that's going to be um, a habit like a weekly habit for, for years. The biggest thing that helped him through all this was the guitar. And I think it was a blessing. When he played the guitar, he wasn't thinking of the condition that he was in at all. I wouldn't have even known that I was in a hospital bed when I was playing guitar. It was one of the very, very few things at that time that um, brought light and made me forget about what I was dealing with. It was probably also the first time that I started expressing myself through the guitar in a deeper way. Sometimes it was anger. A lot of the times it was sadness. The process of looking after kids with cancer, you rarely see this aspect. You don't see what drives them, what keeps them going, what their motivations are. I was impressed, it's impressive to watch a young person uh, display the sorts of fe uh, the skills that you associate with an older person. Accompanied by Dad, young Nathan arrives at a local shopping centre for yet another performance. My parents at that time had quite a passion to support leukaemia research, so they involved themselves in fundraisers, which meant that was an opportunity for me to play as well. Now there was a real reason for me to play guitar. To save people's lives. To save people's lives? Yeah. How are you going to do that? Put the money into the hospital and they can find out what's happening to all the children. For him to be able to feel like he was raising money to be able to help other sick kids, um, it was a really, really positive thing. During that period, I would say my biggest hero, guitar hero, was Martin Offler from Dire Straits. He was the guy that inspired me to play, him and my dad. And what's your number one wish? To jam with Martin Offler. To jam with Martin Offler? Yep. <laughs> do you think you'll ever get the chance to do that? Um, mm, I don't think so. Nathan was in hospital and he was referred to us by a clinician who thought that he really needed something positive to look forward to. Starlight started as a wish granting organisation and uh, he wanted to meet Mark Knopfler. And I think when people called and said, would you help us, everybody helped. When I first heard about the wish, it seemed like enormous. It seemed like it was a bridge too far. I just didn't think that Starlight could possibly come up with, could they arrange something like that across the world with a megastar? So I'm on my first plane trip ever to London with the whole family and then yeah, in walks Mark Knopfler. Hello there. Hi, How are you? Good. Pleased to meet you. And then straight away I remember thinking, all right, whatever I've got to play, I just hope I don't stuff it up. When I 
instead of playing, you think, oh, this guy is a genius. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You're unbelievable. That is really, really good. I think it just made him think, I could do that. I could do that. And Mark said to him, one day you're going to be the leader of your band and you're going to be, you know, really strong and and um, and you'll be a tough leader. What you need is another guitar and an amplifier. Mm. So if I give you a guitar and an amplifier... I can give you money to borrow. No, no, it's all right. <laughs> I've just got paid. Nathan Cavalieri. Hey! When we got back from London, life changed. We didn't know it was going to, but the media attention was huge. I suppose it's where the actual career aspect of my life started. I was seven. I suppose the most common title at that age was Child Prodigy, which is not something that I really enjoyed as a kid because I just wanted to play guitar. Nathan came on tour with Jimmy Barnes and I in 91. I just remember like being amazed at what, what I was hearing, you know. Um, it just sounded like a fully blown blues master up there just kind of doing his thing. You're gonna play a bit of guitar tonight? I haven't been this excited since I started Pindy. He was still going through chemo at the time, so we we had to be very cautious. You know, I was doing a lot of my gigs while I was being treated for leukaemia, but as soon as I'd stepped foot onto that stage, it was like I'd have superpowers because everything would just disappear. I did see him look a very pale shade a few times and the dark rings around under the eyes, that would always concern me. That's when you'd sort of realise it's like, this is real. This is your first very own American tour. What does that yeah, mean to uh, you? I, I can't wait. I can't wait to um, go to all the places around America. My first encounter with the US was playing these little blues clubs and I hadn't ever experienced an audience that reacted so intensely. We did the Tonight Shows, the Conans, we did El Senior Hall. That kid is hot, huh? He, oh yeah, you can hear him. G give a little something for Tom. He's down in Memphis and, and, and something real nasty for him, make him feel at home. It just so happened that one day, Michael Jackson was watching, which then led to a deal about a week later and got us to make our first American record. All right, okay. We did a tour with B.B. King for a whole summer. G'day, B.B. Good to see you, guys. How you doing? Nathan, you know, I was just hey, thinking, hey. you're the youngest person that I've ever worked with that's so professional. When I first took Nathan on, I was warned by everybody in Hollywood. There's a lot of predators out there, and they certainly came out of the woodwork. The pedophiles came out um, when you put a cute kid on TV, um, and there was a constant uh, protection to make sure that we, we knew who was who, uh, and we never left Nathan's side at any, any time whatsoever. And obviously, um, Nathan was signed to Michael Jackson's label, and then of course, the situation arose with the, the media and the allegations that happened. There was obviously a lot of tension around his name in the public eye and it seemed quite foreign to me because there was, yeah, definitely nothing inappropriate going on to do with me. The kid from Sydney's western suburbs is in New York. Fine, thanks. And getting the star treatment. Family was the number one thing when we were on tour. Nathan got the all clear from leukaemia when he was 12, but because we nearly lost Nathan, it was it was so important for us just to to be together. To stop Nathan getting the big head, a lot of the times I would just say, "Hey Nathan, 
You're not too old to get a smack. Going from tour to back into the classroom where it was like I had a target on me. My first day of high school and I had this kid that was taking me around, he took me around to the back of the lockers and then he said, oh, you're that kid that's on, on TV, right? And then he tripped me, uh, he put me on the floor, he grabbed a tennis ball and slammed it into my eye and yeah, he shouted out some profanities, had a laugh and ran off. That was my first day of high school. Who do I care about when I can't care for myself? Walk the walk, drag my feet. Around the age of 14 or 15 is when I really started to get embarrassed by my accomplishments. School, I didn't play guitar at all. I refused when I was asked. I wasn't proud to play what I've always played because it wasn't young people's music, it wasn't grunge, it wasn't punk. Don't you ever feel like a zombie? The magic was gone. He went from being one of the finest, most emotional, incredible emotive guitar players to flat, to boring. And that was the start of the end of that era. Well, I feel like a zombie. Yeah, I was questioning whether I wanted a career in music at all. The last gig of that period under my own name was performing at the Paralympic opening ceremony. And after that, I picked up a shovel and went to work as a brickies labourer. <laughs> it's almost like he was lacking a bit of confidence in himself. And I said to him, look, why don't you come work with me? So we had to go at it. Then he, he was a good brickies labourer. Nathan was frozen in time as a 10-year-old. Oh, you're the kid that used to play guitar. He just wanted to break away from that and go, no, I'm, I'm like a human, I'm a man. I'm not that uh, sideshow anymore. I'm real. I was in soul-searching mode. I didn't know whether I wanted to be a singer, a guitar player, a songwriter, a producer. I met Nate through a mutual friend in Melbourne. And he just called me up one day and said, do you want to come in and meet Nathan Cavalieri? Do you remember who he is? And I said, well, yeah. He said, you don't remember, you know, Hey Hey it's Saturday, um, touring with Michael Jackson? I said, mm, no. I did remember him, but not through the way a lot of people do. I knew him through the movie Camp Nowhere back when I was super young. It was a kid's yeah, film. At least at home they have cable. I think he had maybe seven lines in it. He was literally the Aussie kid guitarist in the film. Yeah. And I was, <laughs> I was obsessed with him. I thought he was the cutest. So when my, you know, mutual friend told me I was gonna meet him, very, very excited. He never spoke about himself or his past performances or who he played with or anything like that. I used to have to ask his parents. I felt like my name was working against me. I just didn't want anybody to see me. And if I was forced to say my name or somebody called my name out in a public setting, <laughs> it was cringe. It's cringe because people would look and I would just assume that they hate me or they think I'm cheesy. When you jump, I'm going up, but we're going down. I continued to make music. I had this craving to be in a band with my friends, musicians that were my age that I can party with and play the music that I love, which at the time was really heavy rock. He didn't want to perform as Nathan Cavalieri, and I'm thinking, why? Why aren't you using your name? I think that was just a way to kind of completely cut himself off from what he was. 
Um, he didn't want to be Nathan Cavalieri. He wanted to be part of a band. This is, uh, this is going to be a show. <laughs> The band was called Nat Cole and the Kings and within the first year we were playing Byron Bay Blues Fest. We were like topping the blues charts in um, iTunes charts and yeah, our crowd was growing. And then I ended the band. I was starting to struggle with my mental health and I had to work out why. So I remember walking up on stage at Queenscliff Music Festival and I just, I didn't feel right. I had pins and needles all through my body and I had a mini blackout. I hit the ground. That was my first anxiety attack, but I didn't know it was an anxiety attack. That night is when my love for the stage had been completely corrupted. And it scared the hell out of me. The anxiety attacks kept happening and I began to worry that I wouldn't be able to perform again. I lost a lot of friends and a lot of mentors during that period, two to suicide and um, one to cancer. It was a time where I started to realise my own mortality. This could happen to me. This could happen to me tomorrow. The fear was about death and my lack of education on how to deal with that fear is how it turned into um, daily anxiety. I'd go to bed thinking of death, I'd wake up thinking of death. It felt like the real Nath, or the Nath that I knew that I fell in love with, we was starting to disappear. It just, there was the, the sparkle in his eye had just kind of gone out. I remember saying to her, I can't live like this anymore. I can't, I can't live like this anymore. And in that moment, I could understand what would make somebody want to check out. Never been able to understand it until that point right there. I seriously thought that um, he, sh he should just give up music. I thought, you know, this is too much for him. It's quarter past four. I can't sleep. When Nathan talks about death, I think it's all related back to the leukemia days. I think what probably amplified that fear of death was looking back and realising that I could have died. I would say that that's the first time I realised that I was fighting for my life when I was a kid, like properly understood it. Young people who are cured of their cancer sometimes carry scars of that into adulthood. As a five-year-old and as a six-year-old, it doesn't really sink in. As you get older, you, you appreciate how close you could have been to death. It's been a heavy week. I'm letting it go. I'm not taking that shit to bed with me. The insomnia was out of control. Nope. The idea of touring just triggered terror. I had to stop. I didn't want to be on stage anymore. Very grateful for music. Listening to it and writing it and playing it. Yeah, the thought of such a talented guitar player not performing and possibly never performing again is just such a, a waste. Nobody knows the way I feel. So I had this weekly gig down in Sydney at this little pub. I invited him just to come down to have a play. And I told him, no pressure, whatever you want to do, I'll have an amp there for you, I'll have a guitar. So I never said to the audience, this is Nathan Cavalieri. <laughs> I hadn't performed in three years, but I knew I had to conquer the fear. I just wasn't sure if I could. Once I got up on stage, all that nervousness, all that fear turned to excitement. I just played one song and I walked away and I wanted more. I, mean, I was on cloud nine and it reminded me of how I used to play when I was a kid.
as a real eye opener. It was only until then I actually started to deal with what it was like to be a child star, if you want to put it like that. Those moments show me that I might not have digested the experience of being a child star properly. And for that matter, even celebrated any of my achievements, none of them. He played on stage with the best and held his own. And he never actually allowed himself to feel that as an adult. It's actually brought him to the realisation that he has had a remarkable life. Yeah, Nathan Cavalier. And it's OK to enjoy that, the, the best of it. It's OK to feel the worst of it. I continually, in phone calls, just said to him, whatever you do next needs to just be under your name. Like, use your name, use what you've done, be proud of what you've done, be proud of who you are, and especially be proud of your past. And by doing it under my name meant no more hiding. It's kind of like I'm stripped of all my clothes and I'm out there, I'm, I'm just me. And I'm Nathan Cavalieri. I had demons sleeping in my bed They woke up and filled my head I think it was a massive thing for him, the reclaiming of his own name on a psychological level and almost a spiritual level. It's more than just the name that he made his music under. I think there was a lot riding on that for him. And then things kind of came full circle when the Starlight Foundation reached out to me, inviting me to play at one of their annual fundraisers, which involved me getting up on stage, talking about my experiences in relation to Starlight and the effect it had on my treatment and, and my life in general. Let's all very warmly welcome Nathan to the stage. I kind of felt there was a bit of coming home. I think everybody who was at our dinner that night knew Nathan Cavalieri. There was a lot of love in the room because people have such warm memories of him as a child. Lots of amazing things have happened uh, over my time and I can trace a lot of it back to what Starlight did for me. And to see him now, to see that not only had the impact of Starlight changed his life as, as a child, but the, that focus on positivity had really helped him even now as an adult. There was a lot of anxiety and it still goes on today, but the drive and the fire and the spark all came back. And I hadn't seen that in a long time. Having kids has probably been one of the best things for him. I think it took his mind away from him and he was able to focus on these two beings that he loved more than anything in the world. I think I might have said to him, like, you know, I really hear in the music that everything that you've done has brought you to where you are now. I think Nathan has, has found his voice. What I've learned over this whole period is how adversity can teach us and inspire growth. And if I ever love again, As a kid, I had something to play, but now I feel like I've got something to say. Thank you.